you know, coming to you live from World Championship in San Jose. Welcome to the Living Legends Podcast. How's it going, everyone? And welcome back to the Living Legends Podcast, your weekly flesh and blood podcast where we talk about all aspects of the flesh and blood trading card game. You've already read the title and you've seen the thumbnail if you're watching the YouTube version today. We welcome back none other than Brian Gottlieb here onto the podcast to talk about bright lights, flesh and blood, round the table, just just absolutely great stuff. How are you doing today, Brian? I am fantastic. It is a beautiful morning down here in New Zealand. The weather is finally starting to shift for summer. Uh, the New Zealanders have a legend about my appearance in the country, and it's become nationwide at this point, mm. where I just bring horrible, devastating weather with me every single time <laughs> I come to this beautiful place. And for the first two weeks I was here, it has been reasonably rainy, pretty overcast, unseasonably cold. Uh, but oh, wow. it appears we are changing the changing the tides, moving into summer now, and uh, the weather's been beautiful for the last three days. So I am thrilled to be here, thrilled to be in New Zealand, thrilled to be talking with you all about some of my favorite topics, bright lights, and of course that uh, round the table box set as well. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we have some uh, uh, more things to talk about than just the singular set this time. So. Uh, hopefully Exciting. we can fit everything into the uh, into the time we have allotted. So. <laughs> yeah, and for the audio listeners out there, just note that uh, as was not able to join us today, so it is sadly just myself, Bill, and and Brian here. So uh, partied yeah. way too hard after that Azalea calling victory did as and just <laughs> absolutely wrecked himself off the face of the <laughs> earth, unable to attend and revel with the rest of us as we all enjoy uh, our glorious leader's ascension to. 100 big points on the Ooh, Living Legend leaderboard. Just fired ahead of all of the stragglers yeah. there, leaving poor, poor Rackney in the dust. So. <laughs> huge jump. Yeah, huge yeah. jump. That's pretty Deservingly good. so. Uh, great yeah. champion. Yeah. Justin was incredible playing the deck and uh, just an awesome event to watch. Our, our buddies Newsen and Sam did a great job bringing us all the rounds, but especially the finals, the energy in that call at the end of the day. And then Justin's winner's interview. If you haven't seen it, you need to go back and watch it what a deserving champion and like just somebody who expressed such genuine love for the game his his companions his friends everything that was going on in the moment it was uh it it felt like a great reminder of why i do this being able to uh give that type of experience to someone and hearing him talk about how much flesh and blood uh like brought him out of his competitive shell it was just so inspiring to hear so please go watch that interview with justin if you haven't had the chance uh, really good stuff. Yeah, this is actually a little bit off the cuff, but I want to ask you a little bit about that that stream because I, I caught a little bit of it here and there. It was pretty long. It was posted on the official Flesh and Blood YouTube channel. So if you don't know, if you haven't seen it yet, it was on the official Flesh and Blood YouTube channel. I, my question is pretty generic. I'm just curious if you, uh, and by you, I mean Legend Story Studios, plan on doing more coverage type streams on the official channel or uh, I'm just curious about it. I thought, I thought you guys did a good job. There was a lot of, uh, for those who didn't watch it, uh it's it's back up there but there's a lot of um like player interviews interviews with uh brian and james uh, that the kind of like cut in sporadically through it um so i'm just curious on that it was pretty cool yeah a little bit outside my wheelhouse not uh something i work directly on okay. but i i know uh I, I was a big fan of seeing it both on the official channel and just yeah. generally how the broadcast was put together and you know where learning and evolving all the time. And as, especially as we work in other areas, you know, we have partners that we work with in the US and Europe and starting to form those strong partnerships in APAC. And we're seeing the coverage of these events just get better and better and better. Uh, and it was really cool to see both Sam and Newsom make the trip out there to do a little bit of uh, play-by-play in color. So yeah, I I expect you will see more of that in the future. I expect these things will keep evolving and uh, you know keep getting more user-friendly and and better to watch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, sweet. Well, let's kind of just uh, get into the meat of the episode. Uh, I kind of wanted to do like a, a small little, um, I hate using such cliche words as like an icebreaker question, but I wanted to have a, like a general <laughs> question since Flesh and Blood just had um, 
its four year anniversary, which is, I think, a really big deal, a bigger deal than a lot of folks give it credit. I think four years for a TCG is a, is a great, great milestone, especially when the game is already, um, you know, doing so well. And then we just had Bright Lights, which is Flesh and Blood's 11th set. So it's over that like 10 set hump, too. So two two really big milestones. And I just kind of want to start by asking your uh, just your general feelings, your thoughts on just how Flesh and Blood is doing right now at these two like big milestones. Yeah, it's funny because uh, those are like the big public facing milestones. But like, man, we're we're cruising into year five. Like, I, I yeah. know what's happening in year five in terms of the cards that are coming out and the things that are going to happen. And uh, and we're heading, you know, we have many, many sets planned in advance at this point. And I just know how much further we're going to go. And so, yes, this is a nice milestone. It is always good to stop and smell the roses and appreciate what you've done, where you've come from. Uh, but there's a lot more milestones in the future that we're looking forward to celebrating in that big five-year milestone just around the corner now, it feels like. So, yeah. uh, you know, we did have a nice little celebration down here in New Zealand. We got together and uh, really did just stop for a bit because we were really, really hard on putting this game together. And it, it's nice yeah. to just take a breath and be like, wow, we've done something really special here, but it's still just feels like getting started man. there's a lot more to do i think that's one of the reasons why it is uh, such a big deal that uh, y'all just crossed the four-year milestone because you're not slowing down at all if anything it feels like things are ramping up quite a bit especially since today we're going to talk about uh the, the first product of its kind like the round the table product uh, and it feels like you're gearing up for more than just uh more booster sets but you also have fantastic booster sets. And speaking of which, let's uh, let's talk a little about uh, about Bright Lights first before we talk about Round the Table. Um, I imagine a lot of folks would like to hear about Bright Lights. Um, so I guess we'll start off with kind of like more one of the more obvious questions. Uh, how did the team arrive at the idea of creating an all mech set? I mean, I think from any kind of perspective, it, it feels like a really... Um, bold move right just to focus one class and not even that when, when you look at the set there's no generics it is all mech mm -hmm. so you're very curious on that yeah i think it's something that's always been in james's mind to do this type of set and maybe not specifically doing an all mech set but just what happens if you do a set all around one class like how do things change what does draft look like what is uh the commercial viability of a product like that like there are so many interesting questions that come with presenting a set in that fashion. And we want the answers as badly as anyone else. We want to know, we want to know, can we do this? Can we deliver on it? Uh, is it going to be a fun format to play? And so, so the way these things kind of have their genesis, everything still starts at the top, man. It, it is James's vision, James's idea. And he, he came to me with this idea of, we should look at doing an all mech set. And I was like, oh man, I don't, I don't know about this. I don't know <laughs> if we can make this work. Like I, I had a moment of, this sounds like a lot. Uh, like, how are we going to keep players interested? How are we going to make this engaging? I I think we succeeded. Uh, you, you guys are going to have to tell me, but I, I think we found the sauce to really go ahead and revitalize this class and offer something new and talking to a lot of folks who are just over the moon about the draft format and uh, really enjoying these new look mechs. And uh, it's it's been an exciting, exciting set put together. So, so different than so much of the other stuff we've done. Um, but I, I got to give James credit for the vision. Uh, he saw a potential, and I, I think the potential was there, and I think we delivered on it. Yeah, I, I honestly so, think... Oh, go ahead, Bill. I'll let you go first. Oh, yeah. I was I was just going to say, the, the thing that um, really stuck out to me as, like, my internal sort of reasoning for why this set existed was because um, there was maybe some sort of acknowledgement on, you know, James White's end that... Um, mech i don't want to say got shafted but didn't get like the same amount of support that most other sets or most other classes did um up until that point so was this kind of his idea just seeing like oh all mech set would be really cool or like we gotta sort of kick them into overdrive so that we can sort of get everybody at the same level um and it kind of sounds like maybe a mix of both uh yeah. this is a cool opportunity to do this thing like to make this means to an end yeah, I think I think a mix of both is exactly right. We're we're very conscious of the heroes that are getting ample support. How long it's been since a 
a, a different class of heroes has been supported, how long it's been, uh, how well we delivered the first or the second time we went to those heroes. Like, did we actually achieve the goals and the visions we had in mind for those heroes? And we're always thinking about those things, and it, it affects a lot how we're going to approach those heroes in the future. Uh, but ultimately, it's just, can you make a compelling, interesting product? Like, can can you make something that's really fun to play and engage with and think about? And if the answer is no, I don't think we would have gone forward with the idea. Like, there had to be enough meat on the bone with this mechanologist offering uh, mm. to to give a product to our players that they'd be really excited about. And that had to extend outside the mechanologist fans. Like, certainly, it's nice to pay off those fans. But you got to make new fans with a product like this, too. And I, I think the different play styles of these three mechanologists have done a good job in doing so. I fully agree. I think the just the the flavor of uh, Tech Lavasin being this sort of very Iron Man adjacent. I know a lot of people make that immediate comparison, but uh, Kel was talking, I believe, last week or the week before that uh, the art style was obviously it did draw some amount of comparison to Iron Man, but they wanted to mm. make it his own. Um, his own thing. That was something that I read from the artist who did the the art for for what we call mm-hmm. uh, Mech Lovas and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was Billy Christian. Um, he's a really yeah. cool dude, absolutely fantastic artist, and he kind of like did a little blurb about him drawing uh, Tech Lovas and, and how he wanted to make it different from Iron Man or Ultron or whatever. And so he had like some unique challenges, and he I think he did a really great job. I think if you take a look at the silhouette of the character. Um, He's got like these like little floating bits around him and stuff. I, it, I don't know. It looks pretty cool. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, I think that that sort of to me, at least encapsulates almost uh, flesh and or not uh, well, flesh and blood, but bright lights specifically as a set where it's like you're pulling from uh, this, you know, of, for flesh and blood in general and saying, you know, we want to do this, but we want to do it slightly differently. We want to make it so that this is our own. I don't know of many other um, sort of very class specific uh, card games, even um, outside of that, like magic or anything like that, that would have the sort of gumption or or bravery uh, to sort of say, you know, what, we're going to do an entire full set that is just based around this fraction of our playability. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think you I think you guys nailed it. Um, the the classes, <laughs> I even say that they're different classes, same class, but the different play styles within it do feel very sort of distinct, which is yeah. very impressive, especially considering the limited environment where there are cards that do overlap between the three different strategies, but you can still sort of pick cards between those to make a cohesive individual strategy. Like it's just such a crazy balance for you guys to have to have hit. And I think you guys, I think you guys did it. <laughs> like, I think it's really impressive. Were those uh, three archetypes always kind of like the three ones that you wanted to focus on? Kind of like the, you have the Evo, Evo archetype, you have the the item archetype with Dash, and then you have Max with his kind of like boosting and hyperdriver stuff. Yeah, well, once we were in the development stage, those lines were pretty well drawn. Uh, you know, in the design phase, there's a lot of fluidity and you're kind of just throwing a lot of ideas around until you hone in onto what the actual structure will be. But once we were in the development pipeline, it was always focused on those kind of three setups. And uh, the the one of the most interesting things is just the way those three can potentially bleed into each other. And sometimes even cross up in the right scenarios. So yeah. while, you know, Teflavasan is very clearly the Evo hero, you know, is there an Evo Dash deck? Yep. Is there an Evo Max deck? Yep. Are they as common? No, but they do exist. And those sideways archetypes, I think, are part of what keeps um, this approach so, so interesting. And, you know, you can play it the other way too. Like, can Teflavasan be more focused on items? Well, there's some very specific ones, like things like, Oh, man, I, I am so reaching the point of my experience with Flesh and Blood where I am having a hard time telling between real names and internal playtest names. Right, yeah, I'm going to yeah. call it security script. I think that's what actually went to print. I'm not 100%. Did I get that one right? Okay. Uh, so where you defend with a card and you get the, the buff on it. Um, yeah. There, there are modes of a Teclavasa deck that can be more item focused. And, uh, you know, same with Max. Those, those boom grenades are powerful in every archetype. So... Maybe you have more broom grenades. Maybe you're just all in on 
uh, actual hyper drivers and you just have three or four actual hyper drivers in your deck and that influences your hard item count and you're able to make use of some of those other cards which are quote unquote dash cards i think those are all really interesting bleeds and and pretty key to really getting to the depth of the bright lights limited format and one of the things that is most exciting to me about the depth of this format which i played just so 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 much of um i i know there are so many things that i know are present in this set that people have not found yet and and <laughs> This is a complicated set, meaning there is a lot of depth to it. And there's multiple, not only just like card by card interactions, there's multiple pure archetypes that we played internally that I've never seen anyone mention. And my pick mm -hmm. for the best common in the entire set, I've never heard anyone talk about it. So it, it's so, so fascinating to me how these things are going to evolve over time. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so then, I mean, like, how difficult was it to build and design an entire set that is just a singular class um it it was a challenge i mean there there were points where uh it was it was it, it was real hard to pull out these identities right because there is a core mechanologist mechanic there is this boost mechanic which informs almost everything around the met class and uh getting to be able to pull everything back to that while still making a compelling limited environment. Cause that's one of the most interesting things about boost is that when you're playing with smaller deck size, that boost cost is really, really hard. And I think I see a little bit of that reflected in sort of early impressions of this limited format. If you just go into bright lights limited and are going boost, 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 you're going to have a bad time. Like yeah. yes, Tekla Watson is going to fatigue you. You need to understand how to get the most out of every single card that you are playing. And I think Bright Lights, more than any other set before it, emphasizes uh, fatigue as a feature, not a bug. You are fighting against the size of your deck, and it's something you have to prioritize and think about. And think about how to get maximum value out of every single card in your deck. Sometimes you are supposed to pass on damage because it preserves a card in your deck. You know, that comes up so, so often. With Max, I can't tell you how often with Max I'm much more willing to, uh, you know, close a chain with my O3. I certainly do not want to be boosting with my O3 attack. I think that is uh, a huge mistake. I see Max players looking at, I, I want to boost my three sixes. Like that's when the turn gets interesting. That's when the output gets large. And sometimes I am just going with Banksy to end a turn because I would rather have the card in my deck and two less damage, three less damage, but still a meaningful threat than whatever the ceiling output is. And, and that just comes up over and over and over again in Bright Lights. And you have to wrap your head around that mode of playing to really succeed in the limited format, which I think is great. I think that's another level of depth. And if it was just boost, 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 are you dead? Not an interesting format, man. Nobody wants to play that. And, and the depth is there with this. And it's really, really exciting to see it get unpacked. Yeah, I, I want to... Just kind of mention that I find this type of fatigue a lot more interesting and enjoyable to me personally than the more defensive fatigue. I'm not sure what you want to call this, like aggressive fatigue or something like that. Some, you know, a fatigue where you, you know, basically mill yourself out rather than just try to turtle up and block everything your opponent does. I find it a lot more interesting, both in terms of like game decisions, uh, whether, you know, like, like you said, choosing whether or not you want to boost your weaker cards or, you know, to save up. Uh, rather than just being like, hey, I'm going to pack my deck with like 50 cards and just block everything. Um, yeah, I, I, I quite quite enjoy it. I've played a little bit of Bright Lights Limited, definitely not even a, a shred as much as Brian here has played. But um, I've had a lot of fun with it. And I'm I'm someone who loves Limited. It's like traditionally one of my favorite ways to play card games just in general. So uh, um, I've been having I've been having a lot of fun with it. I, I've come up. I've had more like what I would call like big brain plays playing bright lights limited and even in crack shuffle play and we'll talk about crack shuffle play in just a second but uh where i realize i'm like hey i can do something really really cool where you can string things together you know um be able to create a hyper driver off of max just so you can get that one extra point to do a boost followed up with your banksy to do like a, a big old like 16 17 damage turn in uh in limited it's just uh it's, it's it's fun and it like gets those uh Pun definitely intended those gears turning. So uh, uh the rabbit hole goes deeper, man. I'm telling you that the depth is 
is there. There's there's some stuff and things present, and I hope everyone gets to suss them out. I I can definitely see there's stuff that like like I'm just looking at some cards like uh, like system reset. There's some cards that really can do. I'm just gonna call them like shenanigans, like fabricate system reset system reset. There's like I don't I I haven't pieced it together yet, but I'm sure there's like I'm sure there's some stuff there. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, honestly the deck that I'm most excited to put together um, with all of the new toys that Mechanologist has been given. Uh, everybody's looking at Max as a super aggro deck. I'm looking at Max as a way to make uh, other hyper drivers that can be cranked so that I can funnel all of the extra action points into grinding gears and uh, just have like either uh sort of incremental value off of that or just one big turn where i'm just like yeah okay i'm gonna mill you for six seven um and like especially in a format like blitz where uh it is a little bit more aggressive and and that happens like that can push you straight towards the fatigue game like right away <laughs> and yeah I, that's, there's a lot of sideways build arounds in this set that i'm really proud of uh just mm -hmm. very unique cards and they're they're not meant to be tournament meta defining cards but they are meant to allow you to build a really really cool fun deck that you can bring to an armory and you know if everything goes right you, you steal the event that day and you feel really good about the cool thing you put together and i want to see more of that in flesh and blood i, I think it's mm -hmm. really important that we empower that mode of deck building uh bright lights is a good way to do so and uh you know a, a bit of a tough start in classic constructed for some of the bright lights heroes but we're in a powering down phase. I mean, I, I think that's very, yeah. very clear to everyone. There's some really, really strong heroes. Uh, there's one in particular that is on her farewell tour right now. Like mm -hmm. for you Lexi fans out there, of which I know there are a couple on this podcast, like you, <laughs> you got to get your reps in. You know, she's headed to that living legend pool in the sky. And uh, <laughs> it's it's an exciting moment for the game. But I also think uh, I'm really happy we got the opportunity to give her the send off she deserved as a hero as a really top tier hero yeah. uh in in this period of time at the end of her life cycle after being just just a, a bit of a dog for a while and you know maybe we'll see that same cycle repeat itself with azalea in the future but uh I, i'm very satisfied with the way that has played out but the ultimate conclusion of that is going to be a powered down flesh and blood and uh then i think you need to throw out your perceptions of these uh bright lights heroes and, and start over on the square one, because there is cool stuff there for sure for the CC metagame. I actually had a, a very long conversation in my uh, Rogues Gallery Discord yesterday, kind of about kind of about that, not not exactly about Lexi. It started off as a uh, discourse about warmongers, and it basically led to me talking about how it really feels that ever since, I want to say maybe Dynasty, that the, the power level of the heroes seems to be a lot more tempered. I'm not going to say it's like, lower but like you said it feels a lot more um i don't know the right word like more even it, feel, it feels a lot more tempered than what it was before i'll because... let you in on a secret it's it's action point economy that's yeah, that's 90 yeah, percent yeah. of what it is and oh, that yeah. is an intentional decision and it's not necessarily to slow down the game of flesh and blood like there should still be aggro decks that should absolutely happen we're not trying to push everything to the middle but action point economy is a, a little bit tighter and that yeah. is reflected in these heroes and one of the biggest exceptions to that honestly may prove to be dash io who actually has the capacity to get very action point rich via the ability off the top of the deck these crank items mm -hmm. um and i think when things become a little bit more feast or famine in terms of action points something like dash opening up those different play styles becomes very very interesting yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um i do want to talk about uh crack shuffle play but this actually I'm going to skip that one right now, and I'm going to go to a question that I had about um, variants, because I think it it, it 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 pairs nicely with, with what we were just talking about. So you've mentioned variants before, like on, on Twitter and on other things. I just want to talk a little bit about what variants means to you in regards to um, into card games, and I guess specifically Flesh and Blood. Yeah, I just think it's an important feature of card games. Like, we all want to believe we want to be playing chess but very few of us actually do probably like if you actually want to suss it out at, at any given time like there's only probably one person on the planet who would say if you had to play a game of something uh for your life 
against the next best player in the world, what would you want it to be? There's only one person who can answer chess, and that's the actual provable best chess player in the world. And that's not what you want TCGs to be. That's not yeah. an interesting game to engage with. Uh, variance is supposed to be present. I, I talked a bit, you know, a few months ago about wanting there to be a bit more variance in the game. And uh, frankly, I think we've done a good job of that. And I don't think we need to go much further than where things are now. I think we okay. have introduced a bit more variance than there was previously. Uh, you know, maybe there'll be small steps up and steps down with various metagames, various best decks that introduce more or less variance. But, uh, you know, when I was sort of making my first statement against variance in flesh and blood, it, a lot of it was pointed towards Oldham. And mm -hmm. one of the things that always frustrated me about Oldham is that it, it's not so much that he, you know, he he does draw different cards on a turn to turn basis. Output will look different on a turn to turn basis. It's just that the baseline is always exactly the same. It's always I will pitch a card, put it into my hammer, block with these other three cards, or use my crown of like what whatever the permutation is. The baseline yeah. is always present, and what that leads to is uh, when you sit down to play against players of either certain deck constructions or uh, certain skill levels matchups from the perspective of a very good olden player can be near deterministic like if you know certain person is not going to get the absolute value they need to out of their cards you know you're going to win and that can become yeah. very clear to you over the first couple turns of the game that's what i found unacceptable in flesh and blood and i think with the absence of oldham from the metagame and with you know some other cards that we've added in that sort of throw wrenches into very well laid plans variance is getting to a good place right now and i'm i'm really happy with how that's been reflected in tournament results quite frankly it, you know we've got our first few weeks of results now with a calling and a bunch of battle hardens in the post bright lights metagame and certainly looks like lexi is still the best deck i think if you were to just ask like what deck should you bring to a tournament the answer is almost always lexi uh in the dark that changes when you're a practiced azalea player when you're you know bravo inside and out and when you look at these uh top eights you see that reflected in them there is still despite the fact that there is a best deck a diverse array of heroes being represented uh lexi certainly closed really hard down the stretch in that first run of events i you know she like flat out won the first four events of the season yeah but she wasn't overrepresented in those top eights for the most part maybe one exception uh and now when we go to the calling you know a little bit larger field uh, a lot of players who worked really hard in their prep thought really carefully about that let's see uh matchup we did see a top eight six different heroes uh four different heroes in the top four non lexi winner in the end and i, I just think like variance is what allows something to have like that to happen while still identifying yes lexi may be the best deck but there's other good options out there and uh, i think like should oldham have been in that spot and uh, oldham never quite reached this level of variance denial but was very close and took a lot of nerves to make sure he never did uh in that spot of oldham being the best deck i think you have often very different outcomes where you just can't overcome that brick wall Oh, yeah. While with Lexi, it always feels in range. Yeah, I agree. I've, I've been there against Oldham. One of the reasons why I'm uh, not shy about saying uh, Oldham is my least favorite hero to play against in, in Flesh and Blood is just not not fun for me personally. Um, I'm not saying he's a bad hero. I actually like the flavor of Oldham. I think he's cool, cool, uh, cool character. But you know, um, yeah. So. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this is more just more design stuff before we talk about crack shuffle play. I want to talk a little bit about like incremental advantage in flesh and blood because flesh, flesh and blood feels like a game of incremental advantage. Anyone who's played it, especially since from the start, feels like a game of like one damage here, two damage here. If both players are playing it or maybe taking a risk, taking a lot of damage just so you can deal a lot of damage back to your opponent. But most of the time, it's it's kind of like this back and forth incremental damage. And I want to talk about that versus like more of like the big splashy moment style gameplay that you might see in other card games but uh, but we have started to see a little bit more in flesh and blood and uh the the key card from bright lights that that kind of like remind me of this is the uh the new teclovasen demi hero right because once you play him it, it's a big deal if you can pull it off then you have that big big splashy moment so i'm just curious on your thoughts on on these kind of like 
camps in regards to flesh and blood game design. Yep. I think we need to offer both. And I think it's, it's very clear that we need to offer both because players love engaging with the game in different ways. And some want to play towards that one, a big end game goal where you get the moment to feel invincible. And that's really exciting. Uh, as long as you're not truly invincible and you still have to have some capacity to lose a game. And I've, you know, seen plenty of transform tech levels and still lose a game, despite how incredibly, incredibly powerful you are when you hit that state. So I, I think that, uh, is a really interesting mode of flesh and blood. And, you know, you can look at things like uh, Nitro Mechanoid also offering a similar experience, yeah. not a Bright Lights card, but very much empowered by Bright Lights to be a real threat in the metagame. Uh, and then you get outside of the mech classes and, you know, you start talking about decks like Dromai, which I think uh, sort of splits the difference. It's half that incremental Agreed. advantage, yeah. half that, oh, I've now set up this really powerful thing and it's really hard for you to overcome. And we just need a diverse array of play experiences that speak to absolutely everyone who wants to engage with flesh and blood. And I think we're getting better and better at offering that. And that also speaks to like that sideways deck building we talked about a little bit earlier, something like, you know, setting up a grinding gears system reset right. type moment uh, that that's going to be one of those big splashy plays that feel really, really impactful. And uh, as, as long as we're doing a good job, allowing both play styles, giving counterplay to both play styles, I, I think it's, a completely fine place to be uh if you prefer incremental games of flesh and blood you're still gonna get to play those they're they're not gonna go away from the game and i that, that's what it's all about just offering diversity of experiences and i think we are doing a good job of that right now yeah i, I agree and i think that's one of the reasons why uh i personally and i know a lot of other flesh and blood fans find um new sets and new cards so interesting uh because you do offer a pretty wide range of of play styles and it, it does feel like you're offering them more and more with every new set like the grinding gears that we talked about um archetypes and strategies that uh just didn't exist before and i know you mentioned it before but i really love it when when i see these cards that these these kind of like oddball cards that likely won't be you know super competitive viable but that offer these al alter you know alternate strategies and sometimes these alternate strategies can make it into like actual fully fledged decks and i think this is a great segue Absolutely. into I think it's a great Absolutely. segue into um oh I want to talk about crack shuffle play first. I was gonna talk about the the tiger strategy. Um, but we'll we'll save the tiger strategy first. Let's talk about crack shuffle play, and then we'll talk about tigers and round the table real quick. So um crack shuffle play. I, I'm very curious on on this just kind of in general. I, I played um I did a full stream where me and my buddy Jim did crack shuffle play. Um I had a blast actually. I thought it was a, a, a ton of fun. Um and I'm just kind of curious at what point in development was Crack Shuffle Play considered? Was it something always from the start or was it something that you realized like halfway through development? You're like, hey, we can do this thing. Um, I'm just curious on Crack Shuffle Play kind of in general. Step one. It was it was step one oh, really? of cool. uh, the format and being able to offer that experience was really, really exciting for us. And um, I also love it. And I love it because you just get to strip away all like I, I'm so trained on optimization and uh, doing the best thing at all times. And you get to just give up on that for a moment. And like, you know, some people ask me like, oh, are you supposed to pull out the um, the like proto equipments that are it, a part of your constructor or, or your main cards besides the story slot and like put them into your deck? And I'm like, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Yeah. Do whatever you want. That's what this is about. Like, however you want to engage with it. If you want to just shuffle up the cards without looking at them, choose a random hero, and then you draw one of those, you know, like, I can't play this card, throw it to the side. That's fine. That's a fine way of engaging with it. And I think Crack Shuffle Play is designed to encourage people to not worry so much about what is correct and worry about what is fun and have a cool activity to do with your friends between rounds while you're opening boxes and also get to use some of these cards in very unorthodox fashions. And yeah. I, it's just really cool. You know, we talked about some of these interplays across the archetypes. And so, you know, all of a sudden you've just randomly chosen Dash as your hero and you're playing your Crack Shuffle play game. And, oh, it turns out I have a full mech suit here. And now I'm this super empowered thing. And oh, I happen to run Teclo Leveler as Dash at the start of the game, too. So I'm doing this cool thing. And you, you just get to explore all these options when you take the pressure off, the optimization off, and just see how these very cool cards interact with each other. and I think flesh and blood needs more of that more just simple, fun, yeah. no strings attached <laughs> ways to engage with the product. And you can go out with four of your friends with, with one of your friends 
lit a box of bright lights and just do this for a night and have a really good time. And I've done it. And it, it is just a blast and a very simple, effective way to engage with these cards. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I agree on on basically everything you're saying. Uh, I think it's a much more approachable way to play the game. Um, there's a lot less setup time than, like, you know, Sealed, for example. And um, the way we played it, just personally, quickly, is uh, I wanted it to be as, like surprising as possible so what we did is we quickly looked through the pack just took out the the equipment cards without looking at anything else just kind of looked at the borders and then we random rolled for a hero um great it, it turned out that we got mirror matches all three games but uh completely randomly but it was like super super fun uh just every single time you draw a hand you have no idea what it's going to be um yep. and you have to like think on the fly it it it, it was a very enjoyable i can't understate it enough uh, i i highly recommend folks who have not played crack shuffle play to just give it a shot it's only three packs um if you have a full booster box like brian said that's that's a lot of games you know that's what like eight four games with two people splitting a box if you yeah. if each person keep, has a keep box it on game. your shelf for game night and like when you're yeah. you, you know it, it just gives it more utility to these cards and lets you play with them in in more circumstances which is just really exciting to me because ultimately i just want people to play as much flesh and blood as possible that's what i care about above everything else i want them to play yeah. have fun I think this is a new way to do so that's going to appeal to a lot of folks. I think it was also for me personally, too. I, I did like, you know, read through all the cards. It's like a little set review kind of thing. But I still think playing with the cards really, really gives you um, a feeling of how the set works, how the set is more so than just kind of like cracking packs and looking at cards or whatever. Um, yeah. So highly recommend it, especially for those out there who are listening to this and you're like, hey, I don't like mech. I, you know, I'm skipping on bright lights because I don't play mech. I think this is a reason to just play it and give it a shot. I think it's really fun and and worth it. And like I said, it's only a couple packs, so the 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 cost is is pretty low. Uh, the barrier of entry is pretty low. Um, we also, by the way, house ruled it that if you pulled a mech legendary, you got to play with it. Um, none of us did. Spoilers, but sure. still, like that's part of the fun, right? If you are lucky enough to pull, do whatever you want, man. Whatever heart, you yeah. want to do, however yeah. you have fun, you are you have my permission. I, yeah, if anyone great. argues with you when you are playing crack shuffle play, that no, that's not the way it's intended. I want you to point them to this video, and this is me saying, do whatever you want to do and have the most fun possible. That's the way to engage with this format. It is, yes, it is like very very fun, and I think you guys succeeded in making it a very fun product. And, um, yeah, like you said, I, I would, I would definitely love to see more and more stuff like this in the future is, um, crack shuffle play something that you would like to do more of in the future. It, it seems like it yeah. would be difficult, yeah. but uh, I, I think, I think it is an exciting way to engage with the game. And I think it's worth making these opportunities. Now, does that mean there's going to be another all single class, uh, draftable set? I don't know. They're not not anytime soon. There's not one coming out on the horizon. I'll I'll spoil that now. Like this was an experiment, and it wasn't. You know, a lot of times I talk about people see us do something once, and they go, "Well, LSS is now making <laughs> right? all single class yeah. sets. That's how it's going to be." Yeah, yeah. heavy hitters yeah. is all brute, didn't you know? I, that, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have heard people suggest that, and I'm not going to say yes or no, but I uh, I will just say that the way we do things is just experiment, try new things, mm. and just because we do something once doesn't mean like this is how we're going to do it forward. But I am looking forward to the opportunity to be able to do something like crack shuffle play again. I'm looking forward to it too. Um, that's something I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on. If you're like, "Hey, this set has crack shuffle play," I'll be like, "Hell yeah, dude!" Um, and yeah, I think this is a great place to transition into uh, round the table because crack shuffle play is, you know, a very fun, very casual. You can kind of do whatever you want with it, and I really feel that round the table is very very similar right just on a little bit of a bigger scale and meant to be played with multiplayer and if people didn't know for whatever reason out there round the table is flesh and blood's first like multiplayer focused product i think it is safe to say um it is also the first product that has more than two decks and also um featuring a collaboration with a good friend of mine actually uh Tillian community college um so i think it's a it's a product that kind of hits on multiple levels and it, it has a a pretty wide appeal in my opinion um brian what was your involvement with this round the table product uh i was there for basically the genesis of this product and stayed with it throughout honestly the, the creation of this product during its design cycle uh really took up the bulk of my attention 
So uh, one of the good things about having both James and I able to work on the design side of things now is that we're able to split attention a little bit more. Um, so it, it, it did actually make sense for me to shift away a little bit from, I, I think Dust Till Dawn was what was in the pipeline at this time, shift away a little bit from the focus on that and really commit hard to this round the table product and uh, you know make sure it was of the quality we expect from something coming out of Legend Story Studios. And it, it took a lot of work. This was a, a real, real challenging endeavor. And it, it certainly would have been easy to rubber stamp something with the TCC label and just be like, yep, here's our collaboration. But that's not how we approach this. We approach this as wanting to do something special, something unique in the gaming space, something that really put flesh and blood on the map for uh, folks who are playing round the table multiplayer games and, and made them take notice and be like, oh, this is a real option. Our game nights can be occupied with this. This is something, even if we're just talking about not flesh and blood in general, but this box set, this box set being something you can keep on your game shelf for years and years to come and always go back to and have a great time with three of your friends. We were so, so adamant we had to hit that very high bar for this product. Um, so I, I was there from the absolute beginning. I was there till the end. I was overseeing the playtest sessions and uh, designing the cards present in this set and balancing these decks against each other and uh, really getting in the weeds about what it means to create a great, exciting multiplayer experience and all the archetypes that the future of Ultimate Pit Fight should be offering to players who love that format and ways we can really uh, set that format apart from the typical flesh and blood experience. What is it about the multiplayer flesh and blood experience that really allows it to shine and come out as uh, entirely on the same level way of playing the game as 1v1. Because that is how strongly we felt about this product. This was not an afterthought. This was not a secondary product. This was flesh and blood in its core, just offered a very different way. Um, and it was a blast to work on. I felt like I grew so much as uh, a designer a, a game player, frankly, like somebody who could really get into the weeds and multiplayer experience in other card games I've played. You know, you guys know my background. I come mostly for magic. I've never played a game of commander in my entire life. It just does not interest me. It's not how I want to engage with magic. And so lacking that background a little bit, I had to really challenge myself to understand, well, what is it about a game like commander that makes succeed and how is our game different what does our game offer that's something like commander maybe can how can we improve on this multiplayer experience and that's what really drove me throughout this process and i have to say it it feels like the biggest triumph of my design career thus far because it was so far outside of my comfort zone and so unlike anything i ever worked before and the response has been so positive. Like, I'm just so thankful that people are uh, just sitting down and having fun. And you can go watch Prof's Shuffle and Play videos and, and see those folks who, you know, came over from the Magic Sphere engage with this product for maybe their first time, maybe their first few times of playing Flesh and Blood and just love it and embrace it and have a really, really good time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just so proud of the way this product turned out. And none of it would have been possible without the professor's help and his engagement in the product from the beginning. And, uh, you know, really did a great job cluing me in on just what players were looking for, uh, what, what multiplayer focused players were looking for from this product and how we could deliver on it. And uh, I mean, you guys tell me, did, did, did we get there? <laughs> I, I feel like we got there. Yeah. I would love to know folks is like comments, by the way. So if you're listening or, or viewing this, please let us know in, in the comments, but Personally, I, I did a, a whole review on it. I don't want to gas you up too much, but I, I I strongly feel that it is Flesh and Blood's best um, pre-constructed product to date. Um, and I and I honestly don't think it's close. I per, I really love the Outsiders uh, Blitzstarter decks. I actually really love the History Pack One Blitzstarter decks as well for like learning the game and you know getting into the game. But I think Round the Table is kind of on a different level. I think Round the Table is more than just learning to play the game and getting to the, like you said, I think it is a product that stands alone by itself as a really, really genuinely fun product to play with friends that you can pull out, leave the decks completely as they are. They feel powerful enough as they are. They feel very well balanced. Um, one of the things I found very interesting is when I, you know, 
told folks that like, hey, I played around the table. I'll, I'll talk about it. People are like, oh, it, does Ira just dumpster everyone? No, oh, Ira's going to be so good. And I was just like, I didn't say this because I didn't want to say anything about it. But, you know, Ira didn't. Then in, in like the three or four games that I played at first, Ira didn't win a single time. Ira st- was still very strong. Uh, don't get me wrong, but it was it wasn't just cut and dry like oh Ira can just deal a bunch of damage because you have all like, like this interplay between the characters. Uh, Melody has ways to prevent damage uh, to other characters. Obviously, Bravant has ways to do that as well, and um, it encouraged a lot of like table talk and like politicking, and it was it was very very fun and very enjoyable. So. If you haven't caught my review on it, um, I will just say if you like that kind of gameplay, um, I, I more than recommend it. It is so so good, um, more than worth the the, the price there. Um, so yeah, that's not even talking about the other stuff that comes in the product. I thought it was a brilliant idea to have the the the, the packaging be a storage container. I think that just personally for me, um, I think it's cool to cut down on the amount of garbage that a product makes. Um, and literally the only garbage that this makes is the, 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 the plastic wrap on it. And then you just, everything else is uh, useful. Um, there's the play mat as well. Um, so yeah, I, I personally think the product is so good that you guys set the bar pretty high. Uh, you guys set the bar so high that, uh, um, it's like, you, you made something like incredible. Bill, have you had a chance to play with around the table yet? I know you had some plans. Yeah, no, we're actually uh, next weekend, we're going to be sitting down in person and recording uh, a full review. Actually, LSS reached out to the Spike Feeders. Uh, I think I can officially say that now and uh, was interested in us doing a review of the of the box set. So uh, I'm going to be sitting down with a couple of my friends in the Spike Feeder studio and uh, we're going to be taking them for a for a rip. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to look at them uh in any sort of depth i've kept the the package just completely sealed uh, up to this point because i want it to be basically my first impressions as well um but from everything that i've heard and seen and uh the amount of interest locally that people have had um like our lgs's have actually found it difficult to get enough in stock to actually support uh the demand so i think that in itself is a really good sign um yeah yeah, it's uh, I can tell you from it's the type of thing that I could definitely see myself at the very least. And if not other people um, just bringing the entire set, like Cal said, uh, just as it is with the, the decks, you know, maybe maybe just sleeved up and that's it. Um, just bringing them to a game night or to a convention or whatever, and just having something yeah. to do with a group with a bunch of people um, because uh I've I've heard that they are very well designed. I trust that they are because obviously we have uh, great designers over at LSS. The team is absolutely phenomenal. They're really good. Um, yeah. So I I don't have actual uh, experience with it yet, but everything that I'm sort of my my expectations are I think fairly accurate. <laughs> Um, uh, my uh, tips uh, are the bard is much stronger than she looks the professor deck mm-hmm. is also much stronger than it looks i think a lot of people at least when we played underestimated the professor deck and they're like oh i want to play bard or the new stuff uh, and the professor deck can just dumpster people if you just let them suit up um it yeah it, it's uh it's really fun and it's really interesting and i, I personally am going to be keeping a set together just all sleeved up uh mm-hmm. just kind of as like a that kind of product um I was going to, oh, well, I do want to say one thing. Uh, this is not really a question. Just one thing I've noticed. I think uh, you guys did a great job with it in terms of just attracting a lot of new players. Because I have seen a lot of people who are just like, oh, I'm going to start playing Flesh and Blood because of this. Um, you know, I think Prof brought in um, a crowd that isn't typically um, like Flesh and Blood's, you know, usual, usual crowd. It's, it's the kind of people who like only play casual commander or something like that and they don't pay attention to anything else they don't care about whatever they don't care about competitive magic they don't care about Yu-Gi-Oh or any other card game they only do their flesh and blood or they only do their uh their commander group and now they can play flesh and blood in a similar way which i think is great and i even have gotten comments I'm on just, videos oh, go ahead. i'm so happy to have those people on board i think yeah. they're like such a critical part of uh the long-term health of our game the experience of our game that kind of like unbridled joy that yeah. that group has for just experiences and doing things. It's so much fun to design cards when you're thinking about 
uh, how they're going to engage with the play styles. And man, I, I honestly can't wait to do it again. And and it is such a, a cool thing to be branching out into for a game to be able to offer this now what what is starting to feel to me like the fully realized version of ultimate pit fight and i think just having one of these heroes uh in your ultimate pit fight games bravant melody uh professor i mean ira is a little a little different like ira is meant to be a good bridge and and i think that's something really important that uh sort of doesn't get talked about enough with these decks is that you are able to be a purchaser of these decks, introduce this to your, uh, you know, casual play group, your casual multiplayer play group. But say you have that spark of inspiration and you're like, man, I, I just want more of this. Like, I enjoyed this so much. Is there a competitive scene I can engage with? That Ira deck is such a good bridge. Like, yeah. It's able to get you set up to go from the multiplayer type format to going ahead and participating at your local game store. And I think that's so, so cool to be able to have present. But back to my original point, the, those three heroes, Bravant, Melody, and Prof himself, I think they're going to add such a cool, cool wrinkle to the broader UPF experience. And I hope I see so many of them at UPF tables in the future. Oh, yeah. um, and I hope we get the opportunity to do even more of that type of UPF design, push the boundaries of uh, UPF heroes. and. You know, actually, our adjudicator class is doing a really cool job of that as well. <laughs> the uh, Taipan is just a adjudicator. pain, man. Yep. As someone who yep. plays a lot I, of UPF, I, love, I can tell you. <laughs> I love when those adjudicators are at the table. I, I think they are introducing the exact right type of intrigue and table talk and politics. Yeah. And it's so, so much fun. And that's where this mode of gameplay is really going to shine. And we, we will lean into that with uh, gusto in the future. I promise you. Anytime, Ian friend of the podcast everyone should know who ian is here uh every time ian rocks up with his taipanis deck that is a kill on site deck don't let him fool you he he will win like he wins most of the time with that taipanis deck so it's yeah. like this is very good um yeah I, I don't know how much ian has said about his role uh with round the table but he was an integral part of uh some of those early play test sessions and uh someone who really captured exactly the the style of flesh and blood that we were looking to be played you know someone who certainly knows his way around the competitive scene knows how to play a draft knows how to put together a very nasty levia deck but also just has this unbridled joy and appreciation uh for the game in all forms and his presence as as one of the play testers was so so valuable i i can see that like a hundred percent um ian's one of those multiplayer players who doesn't uh he's not the one who's like oh we should all be friends he's like no nah, we should all be like crushing each other um which i appreciate it makes the games go uh you know not not like two hours long uh which is which is good in a, in a multi multiplayer setting um, and the uh the the melody weapon too was very much uh i, I was thinking of ian i think when we got it, that yeah. that clause onto the melody weapon and uh it may have even been his initial suggestion like you should just be able to smash this over someone's head and i'm like you're exactly right you should be able to smash this over somebody said and we found a way to to make it work in the game i, I he did mention that part to me um and i i think the uh that is just a so perfect it's like it's where like design and flavor really really mesh i mean it only breaks if it hits and if you were playing melody by the way here's the here's the pro tip don't attack with it unless it could kill them. So the idea is if it hits them and breaks, well, they die. Your opponent dies. So you don't really, you know, need to use it again. Otherwise, they have to waste a card to block and then you can just keep using it. Um, it's really good. The that that fiddle is is, is really sweet. Um I guess uh, we have a couple more questions before you have to go. I just really I just want to talk about um more about round the table stuff. Um, how did y'all design uh, end up on these four particular um classes and, and and characters uh we have the returning character of ira which does make a lot of sense like you said it's a great bridge between uh competitive play and this and i even said it in my my review i think if you want to take it into the you know your skirmish or whatever you know you could take your ira deck and and probably do pretty well um but uh and it's also ira is also obviously the welcome welcome deck hero so it's a lot of people's first in involvement with flesh and blood but uh how did you end up on these four classes and heroes in particular yeah, a lot of it comes down to Prof's input. You know, when mm -hmm. first talking about Prof, he was so adamant that 
the heroes here uh, offered the really, really core element of flesh and blood that we find all of our players from competitive to casual really, really gravitate towards its hero identity and the uniqueness of those heroes. And the fact that a mechanologist doesn't play like a ninja, which doesn't play like a bard, which doesn't play like a guardian and just hammering home these archetypes and how differently they work from each other, how flavorful they are, how much their mechanics feel like the thing they're designed to represent. And these four classes were such, such a good fit for that exactly. Uh, you know, mechanologists working again as another bridge into the Bright Lights product was very, very important to us. Yeah. So we wanted to go ahead and focus in on that. And then Melody just comes from the concept of the group hug archetype. Like that was mm-hmm. something that we really wanted to introduce to UPF. This feels good. Everyone at the table gets powered up and you could feel Melody's presence on a game. Like the game gets used and it's really, really fun to play while she's present. And, uh, it was just thinking about the type of play styles we wanted to enable, the moments we wanted to set up in game, and it all just flowed together in this perfect harmony of uh, four unique classes that played really, really well and had great interplay with each other. Yeah, I, I think um, Prof's like spot on, like getting that, like, you know character class hero flavor i think is really important for a lot of people especially people who play like these multiplayer formats um prof was even telling me when we were playing it at his place a couple weeks back um kind of jokingly but he's like they did a good like such a good job with the bard like people are gonna love melody more than him and his own collaboration product um and i think that's just a testament to how well uh you guys designed the characters uh both in terms of like the actual character design but like also in terms of gameplay because i could say they're they're very very fun and you know learning how the melody deck actually wins was was a was really fun to me because i kind of did it on the fly right i didn't i didn't analyze the deck it was i went over to prof's place and we're gonna play around the table and he's like here you go um and so i just took took the deck kind of did a quick you know flip through it didn't read the cards and realizing you know how final act kind of you know what 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 you do with final act and all your like um your coins um really kind of like clicked and it was like really cool um especially how the the gameplay flow tells such a good story which is again another thing that i'm really proud of is that when you finish a game of round the table i feel like you could go and tell the narrative of what happened in that game. Oh, yeah. It, and it always, always, always is something cool and compelling and uh, just like a fun story to recount. And I, I think like those, that that ability to uh, relive the narrative tells we're hitting on really resonant moments over yeah. the course of the gameplay. And yeah, I now I, I can't say enough. And, and this isn't me taking credit for the product because it involves so many people. And I, I just am so proud of the work that uh, myself certainly, but just as much everyone else on the team did around making this product so, so good and how valuable the various input was from folks like Ian, of course, James coming up with just banger idea after banger idea. And, and then there's, uh, you know, the artists who delivered on it, like, good God, are these heroes beautiful and i think that's one of the reasons why melody might outshine the professor in the end i think his fears are probably pretty well placed just some of the most stunning art you've ever seen on a flesh and blood card looks incredible yeah i agree um i think i think the creative department just in general uh, doesn't get enough credit for what they do for for flesh and blood i always entirely i harp on this in in my videos so at least i know i'm someone who's talking about it but uh, i always got to give shout out to you know everyone on the creative department everyone from you know robbie to sam to to mj everyone um does an absolutely brilliant job um i think it goes a long way to you know make flesh and blood really what it is and you know give people like reasons other than mechanics to really love the characters and and what they're like investing their time and emotions into so um agree yeah with with that said i mean i you mentioned it before i'd love to see uh, another product like this another round the table product i already said i think this is like a slam dunk home run product i i genuinely hope it sells really really well and i i, I think it should it's just so good and i can't recommend it enough um and i think at the price point it is um it is just it's just great um so yeah can't wait to see more um 
really really excited to see what you guys do and i guess i should say um this is probably not a question you can really answer but would since upf is somewhat of a minor focus for flesh and blood now i'm not going to call it a main focus obviously but uh would we see designs of cards that are you know more upf oriented in more main set or supplemental set products or is this something that you're going to save up and bank it for these like round the table kind of things i think you're already seeing it quite frankly i think you can look back over the past few sets and look at a few cards that uh you know the uh, again 1v1 primary mode of play right now we recognize that and the goal is not to harm 1v1 play the benefit of UPF or vice versa. It's There's supposed to be symbiotic relationships. We're supposed to challenge ourselves as designers to make cards which play equally well across both formats. And we're learning how to do that. And you're starting to see inklings of that in main sets right now. I think you'll see more of that going forward. And we're very cognizant of making sure we're getting full UPF cards that still have absolute functions in the core 1v1 game. And it, I'll, I'll be frank with you, it's not that hard to do that. Like it, it is very plausible to make a card that is interesting in both of those formats at the same time. So I look forward to doing more and more of that in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, this might be the extreme case, but uh, I think I think Warmonger's Diplomacy is one of those cards. Where of course. I first saw it, I was like, oh, this is sweet for UPF. And then it turns out it's also like just really, really good in the current metagame. Uh, like I think that was everyone's game. initial yeah. reaction was just like, oh, cute, a UPF card. And people will go back and they'll tell you, no, no, I knew this card was great and constructed. And maybe a couple did. But on the whole, the response when that card re was revealed was, oh, UPF card, great, and toss it aside. Oh. And See, uh, it, you can make both. You can make both. It was on my top five list of cards for the set, but from a UPF perspective, not from a CC perspective. So I, I love the card to begin with, but it turns out it's also just really good in... Uh, like I said, in, in the current meta. Um, I'm I'm so Bill. glad that that was not just my, because uh, I Tommy Fresh and I, Fresh and Breads, shout out. Um, we do a card by card set review of every single set that comes out. And uh, yeah, when we came across Warmonger's Diplomacy, both of us, I think it was a mixture of, we both just thought it was a UPF card. And it was, I believe, the very last card of a, f like, five hour long stretch of us just uh, reviewing these things. We were both just like, yep, UPF, very good. And then uh, there were a couple of people that commented on it uh, who apparently made it all the way to the end. And they were like, ha ha, look at you. You <laughs> saw this card that's obviously super powerful and you just thought it was UPF. It's like, yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> even even, pro, even pro players reviewing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so that does make me feel better. All right. I think we're about uh, winding down here. I think it's time for uh, Brian to go have uh, some, you know, fun times uh, making flesh and blood cards or other yeah. stuff uh, that that you do at, uh, at Legend Story Studios over there in beautiful New Zealand. Um, I also have to make lunch every day. I did not. I did not negotiate my contract well. So while I'm in New Zealand, I just I cook for the entire studio. I really <laughs> wish I did not put in my contract, but yeah, it is what it is. Hey, I mean, them's, them's the breaks, I guess. <laughs> Should have read the fine print. They really got me with that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well. Oh, uh, God bless. Thank you for coming on and chatting with us about uh, Bright Lights, Around the Table, and Flesh and Blood. We really appreciate your time and you being on here. Um, yeah, thank you. Always a pleasure, my friends. I'm always happy to come back and chat with you all. I'm sure we'll do it soon. I'm glad you are enjoying Bright Lights, Around the Table. Uh, please make sure as does not just eternally party in the aftermath <laughs> of Azalea's victory you, and and keep him safe and bring him back to the podcast. You, you got to know there's going to be like an Azalea cult episode of him just oh, ass, absolutely partying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just the entire thing is just like clips of a party and him just screaming Azalea every every so often. <laughs> yeah, it seems Pra appropriate. Praise be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, um, where can everyone find you, Brian, if they would like to to hear you talk about or listen or to read your uh, words of insight about Flesh and Blood? You can only follow me at Brian Go on Twitter if you promise to be nice to me, because I, I just I can't take any mean comments. But if you are nice to me, you are welcome. No, I'm kidding. You can be mean to me as well. That's no, don't. Fine. Just don't do so mean. in a constructive way. 
don't no, be mean. Don't don't be mean. I, like you, you can always you can always criticize what we're doing. I'm I'm very open to that. Just make sure you're doing so in a constructive way, and make sure you're you know considering all sides of the equation. We serve a lot of players. We serve a lot of desires when it comes to decisions we make at LSS, and you know sometimes you may not be the group we're serving at the moment. But we're thinking about you. We're, we want to make a product for you as well, and, and we'll get there and find a way to do so. Uh, so I never mind good faith criticism as long as it's kept constructive uh, and, you know, is, is analyzing problems as, as they actually exist. So please feel free. Follow me over there. We can chit chat about flesh and blood anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Just be respectful. Like know that yeah. they love flesh and blood as much as you do. Right. So <laughs> yeah. And then how about, how about you, Bill? Yeah. Where can folks find uh, you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Bill TSF. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube at uh, Spike Feeders Fab. Uh, we do live edited gameplay content. And as I sort of mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to be releasing a UPF video uh, with the Bright Lights decks, uh, the Bright Lights product as a whole. Uh, we're going to be giving, you know, the gameplay itself and then also talking about how we feel about the decks um, after playing with them for a couple games. So if that interests you, you should definitely uh, drop us a follow and, and keep your and keep your eyes peeled for that when it comes out. And will that be on the Spike Feeders main channel or the Spike Feeders Fab channel? It will be on the main Spike Feeders channel. Um, yeah, that's we're going to be giving it uh, basically as much of a reach as we possibly can. Um, and uh, I think the product really deserves it. So we um, definitely am, are excited for that opportunity as well. And thanks once again to LSS shout out because it will be a sponsored post uh, like they did send us the uh, the product. So, I mean, I was going to buy it anyway. So just kind of um, streamlined that process, at least. <laughs> yeah, I bought two. <laughs> about two of them. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I find like, that in my job a lot where I'm given things where I'm like, I just would have bought this. Like, yeah, I, yeah. it's not really necessary. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today for this conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see you next time for some more flesh and blood content.